We are always thrilled to have the opportunity to partner with Sustainable Princeton. Uh, this evening, Molly Jones, the Executive Director, will be introducing the program. Thanks so much, Kim. I would say right back at you. We are so grateful to have the Princeton Public Library here in Princeton. It is such a wonderful partner for all of us tiny nonprofits trying to do good work. So thank you, Kim. Um, we also want to thank um, NRG Energy. They are the ones who sponsor this Great Ideas series. So um, we, we owe them great appreciation for helping us bring this content to you. Um, Princeton Community TV is here with us this evening. So we're grateful that for them as well. Um, and Small World Coffee. They have brought the coffee to keep everybody awake and moving. So uh, many thanks. Um, for those who uh, might like this program in Spanish, um, it will be made available in Spanish for anyone interested. So I'm going to start things off by creating um, a little orientation here for the context of what you're going to hear this evening. Um, in 2017, uh, the Princeton Municipal Council put it in their goals and objectives to create a climate action plan for Princeton. Sustainable Princeton uh, was very much in agreement and support, even though we're an independent nonprofit. And so we kind of led the charge to seek funding and began um, pulling together a group to uh, make this a reality. So what is a climate action plan? A climate action plan, it's really a strategic plan with two main focuses. The first, to develop resiliency strategies. As all of us who have lived here in Princeton over the last 10 years can surely attest to, climate change is happening here in Princeton. We see it through the intensity of our storms. We see it um, in the intensity of the heat. Um, and so this change is coming. We need to make our community resilient. Secondly, the Climate Action Plan focuses on developing mitigation strategies. These are strategies to reduce the volume of greenhouse gas emissions so we don't continue adding to the challenge of climate change. These are the steps that one goes through, um, kind of roughly, to create a Climate Action Plan. Um, we uh, here in Princeton have already gone through the step of creating a baseline inventory of our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, some of you may have noticed as you walked in the door, we have a new signboard that we have added in the back of the room that shows you where Princeton is uh, with its greenhouse gas emissions. Essentially, two thirds of our emissions come from commercial and residential energy use, and roughly a third comes from transportation. We do have a little um, wastewater and waste um, uh, emissions as well, but that is those are our, our two largest emitters are surely our uh, energy consumption and transportation. So now that we're moving past that stage, we are now at the phase of adopting a target goal. We have a uh, steering committee developed um, with um, some outstanding leaders from within our community, and they have been charged with this task. They have already met a number of times and have been discussing at length what target they think we should focus on. The start target for the state of New Jersey, for example, is to have an 80% reduction of their 2006 emissions by the year 2050. We're uh, anticipating Princeton will adopt something similar in nature with a number of short-term goals. So helps us look at where should we be in five years, where should we be in 10 years to make sure we're not letting anyone off the hook in staying focused on this challenge. Once the target is adopted, we, and we are already working on this stages of um, doing some forecasting and coming up with strategies for how we're going to meet that goal. We have uh, five different working groups, again, of area of experts. We've really been fortunate to leverage Princeton's um, the expertise in our area to come up with a number of strategies. So we're working through that now. Um, and then we'll move into funding and implementation, which will take place you know, over um, an indefinite period moving forward. But um, again, we're very um, conscious of remaining focused on where we're going to make the best bang for our buck both in human energy as well as making sure Princeton as a town and municipality makes us the best investments. 
Um, so I, I did touch on this, or I um, kind of maybe jumped the gun a bit and explained this a bit already. As you can see, this is roughly, um, here are the um, ballparks of where Princeton's emissions are. This is based on, on true data from our PSCNG data, as well as some um, modeling for our transportation, our real numbers out of our municipal waste and water. So, um, as you're going to hear about a little bit more um, in a moment, the climate change truly is upon us. So when we think of why Princeton needs a climate action plan, this is, this is it. This is what you're living. Here's some images um, from right nearby here. Mercer Road was closed as the police were posting. This was just last month. This was in the month of April. Um, these other images, I believe, are from um, Hurricane Irene. Um, or they may be the shower of July 2016. Trees coming down. Um, as we all know, our power grid is highly um, volatile to the winds that we've been enduring in the intensity of these storms. These, again, are all images from within a couple of miles of here. Maybe some recognize this, Alexander Road. Um, Mountain Lakes Park, this was after Hurricane Sandy. Many, I'm sure, have hiked um, these lands and can attest to the fact that as the wind blew um, through that hurricane, it truly devastated some of our local forests. So um, in addition to uh, the, the visual um, challenges we see financially, this um, the realities uh, are pretty stark as well. Um, as you can read here, um, it's been estimated that every dollar spent on resiliency projects, um, which is kind of smart growth projects, is six dollars saved in aftermath in the cost of what it um, costs to rebuild these things. So this is really thinking about how do we build our bridges? How do we build for the realities of today, not for the storms we had 100 years ago? So this, again, is, is helping us think smart so that we build knowing that this is coming. OK, so with that, I um, want to introduce our first formal speaker um, of the evening, uh, George DeFernando is a, um, let me get, see if I can get all these initial right, initials right, MD, MPH, FACP, is a, <laughs> almost the whole alphabet there, um, is a board certified internist who has combined a career in public health and higher education with a sustained professional and personal interest in the impact of behavior on physical health. He has worked in public health for over 30 years with positions on the CDC, New York State Department of Health, as a deputy commissioner, acting commissioner for the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services. More recently, he directed the New Jersey Center of Public Health Preparedness at the University of Medicine in Dentistry of New Jersey, and is currently an adjunct professor in the Department of Epidemiology at UMDNJ Public School of Health, chair of the Princeton Board of Health, and consults on adult immunization. He's been a member of the New Jersey Climate Adaptation Alliance since it was formed in 2008, and he and his wife and their two children have lived here in Princeton since 2000. George? Lots of initials, lots of uh, all those things. Uh, thank you for uh, bearing with me on that. So this is a presentation that uh, Marjorie Kaplan, uh, who is at the Rutgers Climate Institute, and I have uh, worked on uh, giving a really just a, a, a smattering of the information that's been generated by the New Jersey Climate Adaptation Alliance over the past eight years. That Climate Adaptation Alliance was developed about eight years ago, coincident with some election, I can't exactly remember which one, uh, where here in New Jersey we were struggling to uh, get information together about climate change and climate adaptation, so it wound up being housed in Rutgers. And this is co-chaired by former governors Kane and Florio, who actually have participated in these meetings, but it includes a lot of people from across the state, including business people, uh, PSEG, Verizon, and other people who have a desire to look at 
at the time was called adaptation. We didn't call it resilience, and we didn't call it mitigation. And the mitigation issue was very politically charged at the time, so it was called the New Jersey Climate Adaptation Alliance. But trust me, everybody there is very interested in uh, uh, mitigation. So what this talk wants to look at is a couple of the aspects of climate change that are going to affect Princeton specifically. We're not going to talk too much about sea level rise because uh, despite the fact that we think we're close to the shore, we're not, but so close to the shore. And uh, we're not going to talk about every aspect of health, but as I've given this talk for physician groups and um, uh, I say to them, and I will say the same thing to you, if you don't like the idea of climate change and its impact on health, don't worry about it because climate has so much of an impact on health that if you just pay attention to the impact of climate on health, if the climate happens to be changing, then it, things will just be worse on the impact of climate on health. But if you don't believe or don't feel it's going to change a whole lot, it doesn't matter. Climate has a gigantic impact on health. So here we've got a picture and we're going to look at uh, winter and summer temperatures. We're going to look a, bit, a little bit about rainfall, how much rainfall we have, and we're going to look at uh, when rainfall occurs. Those are the three big issues, but again, if you're going to look at more, you'll see on uh, our webpage for the New Jersey Climate Adaptation Alliance, we have more than you could possibly deal with. So there has been a warming trend in New Jersey in winter and summer temperatures over the past 100 years. This is from 1900 to 2010. And there's been a greater warming trend in summer, just about four degrees in w winter, pardon, than in summer, which really means if you're a gardener like me, the winters start later. They're not as dramatic, despite what happened to some of my plants with uh, freezes and not flowering this year. And they end earlier. That doesn't mean you can't have, and this is what we had in March. We had a nice warm spell with a hard freeze. That's really what wound up killing some of our, our blooms here, but we still had a pretty mild winter, and that four degrees is pretty substantial. Now, our summers are still somewhat warmer, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we're not going to quite get nailed quite as much as some of the other parts of the country, but we're still going to have quite a bit of heat. The variability is much larger, temperature variability is much larger in winter in general, which makes it harder to look at these long-term trends. But nonetheless, as I'm sure we've heard over and over again, it seems like every year, the four warmest winters in Jersey have occurred since 1998, and the four warmest summers since 1999. And here we've got a nice picture of days above 100. And this, uh, some of my data is days above 95 and others days above 100. We don't have many days above 100 in New Jersey. Uh, I believe we got through last summer. I can't exactly remember without a 100 degree day. But, you know, bodies don't particularly care whether it's 95 versus 100 from a public health point of view. 100's a nice round number, but it doesn't really matter to somebody my age, somebody who's got 10 years on me, 20 years on me, or someone who is 60 years younger than I am. I a six-year-old, a five-year-old, a three-year-old. If it's 95 for a sustained period of time, it's really going to put a stress on that person's cardiovascular system, their uh, respiratory system, uh, not to mention the other impacts it has. So here's, uh, uh, here is current 1991 to 2010, and here's 50 years from now. Now, if you've seen these slides, and people see the slides about obesity, if you've been in public health long enough, we've seen these slides where, you know, 50 years ago there were a few obese people in the United States and then there were more, and then it, it gets covered over. These temperature graphs look exactly the same way. So the dark parts, the really dark red parts, will have more than 50, 100 degree days by somewhere between 2045 and 2075. We're going to have plenty of 95 degree days. And as my relatives in North Jersey say, I live in South Jersey. My relatives in South Jersey say, I live in North Jersey. The fact that appears to be that North Jersey will have about 20 more 95 degree days by 2050. South Jersey will have about 40 more 95 degree days 35 years from now. So. You tell me, are we in North Jersey here? Are we in South Jersey here? Let's just split the difference and say we're going to have 30 more days. Right now we have two to five days a year of 95 degrees. It may feel like we've got more than that, but that's all we've got. 30 years from now, we're going to have 30 more of those days. 
that's 30 more stress days for the cardiovascular systems and the respiratory system, not to mention other impacts that that temperature will have. All right, now what's happening with the rain? We are lucky enough to have a little tiny tin copper roof on our house, and two nights ago, whatever was going on was going on right on that copper roof. <laughs> Jer trends in Jersey participation, we've just had an increase of two uh, inches per, um, uh, per year in 100 years. That doesn't sound like a lot. That doesn't sound like a lot to me. I'm not a climatologist. Maybe that's an incredible increase. But the real problem is the variability that we've seen. There's an upward trend that especially comes in the spring and the fall that we've seen. But what's really going on is it's not your imagination. The events, and this, is a, this, is, this shows it, that 71% of our rain will be in mass events. So we're going to have big rainstorms, and Sophie will talk about this in a little while what the impact of that is from a physical plant point of view. We're going to have big rainstorms with drought periods. If you're a gardener like me, this has been an unusual spring. We've had some sprinkling. We did have one little dry period there where my plants were barking at me and I had to, had to water a few of the plants that I had uh, put in earlier. But we've had some years where it's really obvious that you have a big storm and then a big long dry period. I'm going to talk in a few minutes about what impact that has on the mosquito vectors uh, that bring infectious diseases to all of us here in Princeton but it has a direct impact on that. Now here we have the heavy rains may become heavier. This shows all across the world this is going to go on, that we're going to have really heavy rains. This is the percentage of um, rain, and this is from the 2014 Intergovernmental Planet, uh, Panel on Climate Change. We're not, it's not clear we're going to get another one of these intergovernmental panel reports anytime soon. But luckily they're still on the webpage as is the NIEHS report that uh, I'm going to be quoting from on the impact of climate and climate change on health. And here we've got also with dry spells. And if you look at North America, you'll see a lot of area that in this definition, the number of days, of uh, dry spell days. So uh, actually the Northeast, as well as the uh, breadbasket of much of the planet, the wheat breadbasket of much of the planet here in the United States is gonna have long dry spells. And so what you'll have is you'll have these rain events, you'll have long dry spells, you'll have more rain events, and that has uh, some interesting impacts on public health. <clears throat> now, it'll, the nor'easters affecting New Jersey, will these become more intense and frequent? That's what people are asking. We're gonna, so we're going to have these really big storms. We're going to see a lot of Sandys. We don't know the answer to that question, and this goes back to my point. It really doesn't, from a health point of view, that doesn't interest me as much. It does from an emergency planning point of view, and I'm on the subcommittee on uh, resiliency and we were having conversations. I know there's other emergency planning things going on here in Princeton, but from a health point of view, this rain and this temperature is plenty. So to summarize what's going to go on in Jersey in terms of climate, more warm extremes, fewer cold extremes, heavier rains that are more intense with frequent dry spells, and then uh, sea level rise with increasing frequency and intensity of coastal flooding. Other than refugees from Ocean County that may not have a big a sea level rise or if you own a house. Now we put out a big report in December. This is available to you uh, in terms of the New Jersey climate and uh, health profile. Um, that talks about uh, that talks about all these issues in great detail that I'm about to talk about in uh, a quick fashion. Uh, we also did a large report for the new governor um, that talked about all the different climate change issues, and they were nice enough to receive that. The first lady of New Jersey came to receive that, the New Jersey Climate Adaptation Alliance, and the people who have worked in government on climate on the Adaptation Alliance, uh, some of whom I see in the audience tonight, are working with the uh, new administration, ideally to uh, have some impact on both um, adaptation, but ideally uh, mitigation. So this is from the NIEHS document, which luckily is still available online. I checked today. And really, if you look at the implications for health, this, pretty, this covers a lot of ground. 
So if there's, if there's wet periods with, with dry periods, you can get some particulate matter. You can also get nice growth of moss and other materials, other pollen materials. The infectious disease, I'm going to talk about in a second in detail. The red tides, the potential drinking water impairment that comes from flooding, and the heat stress, which I've already extreme, alluded to in extreme weather. This covers a lot of ground, but the NIEHS document really covers, if you look at this, there's not much that goes on in a human's life that isn't going to be infected by climate or chi climate change. So if you look, the, rest, the first is the respiratory system as well as the autoimmune system and the immune system. Uh, potential for cancers from, ex from, uh, re uh, from uh, solar radiation and other possibilities. Cardiovascular disease and stress from, um, uh, from uh, temperature and airborne particulates water contamination, heat-related mortality, direct heat-related morbidity and mortality, and then potentials which are a little more subtle for human developmental effects, mental health and stress-related disorders, um, neurological disease disorders, and that uh, vector-borne, we're back to infectious diseases, water-borne and uh, weather-related morbidity and mortality. And if I could target that mental health and stress-related disorders, one of the conversations we had last week was about the impact on an emergency response person when they go to an emergency response event and they have to take care of someone who is extremely ill, maybe they, even their heart has stopped or they've stopped breathing. This is extremely stressful for, obviously it's stressful for the person who's being, who's being um, uh, resuscitated, but it's incredibly stressful for our volunteers. Now these events increase. If we have 30 more days of 95 degree days in 30 years, or 20 days if you think we're in the north, or 40 days if you think we're in the south, our volunteers are going to be incredibly stressed because they're going to be coming upon people who have heat stress or who have a stroke due to their stress or have a heart attack due to their stress. And so it's not just what's going to be happening to the physical materials we have that we have to pay for here in Princeton. It's the humans that have to deliver the services that are going to be stressed, let alone, and I think about this, uh, you, you might be of a certain age, uh, people of my age tell stories about hiding under desks in the 50s and 60s. I don't know about you, when my relatives get together, that's one of their favorite stories. Let me tell you about when we had to hide under our desk where we were afraid of getting bombed and we all laugh about it, ha ha ha. I've stopped telling that story to my kids because I have this sense that our kids hear the same story but about climate change. They don't hear it about, you know, we laugh now, hey, we survived that, you know, what was, what was all this about the Cold War anyway? But I remember I was old enough to remember, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and you know, crawling under my bed, and I was, gee, I was, a, you know, a preteen at that point. So I have some sense, and there's no quantifying this, right? How much of all of the talk of somebody my age, a little bit younger, we, in a sense, talk about this like it's one other problem? What impact that has on a 15-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 5-year-old who hears about this stuff and says that the world's timing out? We don't know how to quantify that, but I think we can, we probably can agree that it probably has some impact on where their brains are and where their emotional sequence is. All right, let's look a little bit at specific impacts and am I gonna get a, three minutes, okay, so boom, 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 boom. Uh, New Jersey ground level ozone has been decreasing, that's a nice thing. Uh, but it's a lung irritant associated with increased hospitalizations, cardiovascular effects. Here are the elderly and the children again. And so higher ozone levels are increased with increased pediatric emergency department asthma visits during the warm seasons. And when it gets hotter, that's the link. To create, if you want some physiological link, the heat will increase local events of increased ozone, which will wind up causing reactions in both elderly and youngsters, especially in areas right down the road like Trenton where there's a heat effect in an inner city. There are things we can do here in Princeton to decrease that heat effect. I'm gonna skip this one and I'm gonna talk about what I've been kind of teasing, and that is when you have these rainstorms and then you don't have a dry period, Imagine you're behind my house on Clover Lane, and there's this nice stream that's flowing behind my house. It's not a named stream. We had the, our friends from uh, the town come out, so we don't know that the stream is back here. Trust me, it runs all year. But if it rains, and there's a big rainstorm, but then it doesn't rain for two weeks, the mosquitoes couldn't love it better. 
You've given them water to play in, to reproduce in, but you haven't flushed the water out. So the eggs that they're laying get a full period of time to develop and develop nice big crops of mosquitoes. So if you happen to be a paranoid about vector-borne diseases like I am, you start wearing D. You start wearing permethrin covered hats and permethrin covered coats and I have permethrin impregnated pants. I'm a paranoid about the skeeters. So if you don't care about the mosquitoes or you don't worry about ticks or things like that, this will be perfect for you. <laughs> but if you do worry about them, so now I'm gonna finish up by talking about the difference in climate vulnerability based on the individual level, which really I've been focusing on. It might be your age, which I've really harped on, but it might be your occupation. You might be somebody who climbs trees and takes down trees for a living. All these ashes are gonna be incredibly dangerous to take down. So please take your dead ashes down safely. It may cost you more to do that. Trenton and other places that have uh, different mixtures of race and ethnicity than Princeton does or different socioeconomic status, they'll be stressed by uh, some of these issues due to heat islands. But at the community level, what location you're in, whether you're in my hometown of Patterson or you whether you're here, here in beautiful Princeton, what type of infrastructure is around you, do you even own a functioning air conditioner, let alone whether you've been able to spend enough money to get a generator, either a gas powered generator or, or a, um, uh, a gasoline powered or a gas line powered uh, generator. What will it do to our public health resources? What will we wind up needing? Now there, here are the events and this, uh, this will be available I believe on some website somewhere but certainly this, our, our work is available for distribution. I'm going to be distributing to some people. I'm not going to go through each one of these but there are potential heat uh, effects for each weather event and p different populations that are affected. This you can find in our, our report. And this is our good public health wheel. This is what your town Department of Health in conjunction with other departments of health and with the Mercer County and the, the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services ideally will be doing. It'll continue to track diseases and investigate water and foodborne outbreaks and it's going to attempt to communicate on the health impacts of climate change. We're going to have to partner with lots of people and that's what uh, really you're going to be hearing about for the rest of the time and we're going to be ready to deal with heat uh, waves or severe storms. Now we're not really, the, the state of New Jersey itself and the county of Mercer aren't as on top of dealing with mass community based events as the town of Princeton would be in dealing with isolated events for a certain dozens of people. But if we get into a situation where hundreds or thousands of people are displaced, like our, par or like our friends in southern states, we're not ready for that in New Jersey. Full stop. We're six years post Sandy, but we're not ready to move bodies around in this state in a way to protect them. We've had plenty of time to deal with it, but it just has not been done over the past six years. Hopefully it's going to be done sometime in the near future prior to an event that the people in Puerto Rico, Florida, and Texas had less than six months ago. So my nightmare is like that nursing home in Florida where they lose power, they survive the weather event, not the climate event, they survive the weather event, but they lose their air conditioner and the people in that place get stressed to the point that they have a heart attack, they have a stroke, they have a respiratory arrest. That's my paranoid. Forget the mosquitoes. <laughs> All right, and let's see, I'm just gonna skip all these and say we have a beautiful little website there. You can connect with us at Climate Change. We actually got that, you know, URL, can you, if you can believe it, you know, uh, climatechange.rutgers.edu. We're also on Facebook. We have a couple of emails. Feel free. And are we taking questions now or later? Later. We're taking questions later. <laughs> Thank you so much, George. 
Um, these presentations will be available on our website um, uh, uh, as well. So just want you to know you can get it there. I do want you all to rest assured that George and our next speaker, Sophie Glovier, are both on the Climate Action Plan Resiliency Committee. So hopefully that gives you good faith that we've put uh, good people on the task. So our next speaker is Sophie Glovier. She is a Princeton, New Jersey-based author and environmental advocate. Currently, she serves as the chair of the Princeton Environmental Commission and as vice chair of the Garden Club of America's Conservation and, Nas and National Affairs and Legislation Committee. She's a member of the Sea Change Conversations, a volunteer-led group committed to promoting non partisan dialogue and education around the topic of climate change. Sophie has served on a wide variety of environmental nonprofit boards, including DNR Greenway Land Trust, Friends of Princeton Open Space, Sustainable Princeton, and the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Association, where she served as board chair for three years. Sophie is the author of Walk the Trails in and around Princeton, a trail guide that has sold over 4,000 copies and raised more than $10,000 for its stewardship of the trails. She's an active investor with the Princeton chapter of the Investors Circle and a graduate of Princeton University and Columbia Business School and has received a post-master's certification in sustainability and strategy from the New School in 2006. With that, Sophie. Thank you. Well, thank you, George, for um, all that information about public health. And I think what you'll see, which is one of the reasons why it's so important that we're doing this climate action plan, is that all of these things are so interrelated. And there's so much data that we have to pull together from the health community. And I'm going to have a focus tonight on stormwater and the extreme rain events that George started to talk about. But all these things are interrelated and um, impactful to the health of our community, and we really need a plan to address how we're gonna move forward with them. I wanted to start this presentation by recognizing the contributions of the watershed to it. Uh, I'm, a, as uh, Molly said, chair of the Princeton Environmental Commission, and over the past two years, we've spent a lot of time thinking about stormwater. I see a few other representatives or uh, commissioners of the PEC, so could you raise your hands? Um, thank you for being here. And I'd like to recognize Tammy Sands, who also worked at the watershed and uh, was helpful in preparing this presentation. You'll see that the watershed has a new name as of a, a couple weeks ago, the Watershed Institute, formerly the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Association. And many of the slides I'm gonna share with you this evening were prepared by Jim Waltman, the executive director, as part of a presentation that he gave to the town council last year, educating on stormwater. So this is a slide similar but different to the one that George showed. It's from Climate Central. And this shows data starting uh, the change that we've seen since 1958 in the percentage of the percentage increase in extreme precipitation events. So as George said, we're gonna be experiencing our precipitation in fewer events of heavier volume. And why is that? Well, that's because as the climate warms, evaporation increases. So scientists say that for every degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature, the saturation level of the atmosphere increases by 4%. And so when that moisture condenses to come down in precipitation, there's more of it to come down. And we've seen in Princeton recently some really extreme examples. This is a picture of the train station after a significant rain event that we had in July of 2016. We had seven inches of rain, and most of that came in three hours. And here's a picture of Route 1. So we are experiencing this. So we have the climate impacts, but then we have to understand also what's going on around us in terms of land use. And this is a slide that shows how uh, development has increased in New Jersey between the 1970s and the 2000s. And I don't think this is a surprise to any of us, but it's pretty amazing to think about the fact that between 1995 and 2012, the impervious surface in our watershed increased by more than 30%. And just to review what impervious surface is, 
That's things like roofs and parking lots and driveways that when the water falls down out of the sky, it can't get through. So it becomes something called runoff. So that runs off into our storm drains and streams and waterways at an increasing level. So let's get more specific about Princeton. This slide shows the increase in impervious coverage between 1995 and 2012. So that comes out to an 8% increase, which is about 123 acres. So Princeton is eight, about 18 square miles, and right now we have 14% impervious cover. And I think we all recognize that that number continues to go up as new properties are developed and smaller homes are torn down and replaced with larger homes with bigger roofs and bigger driveways and patios. And so the watershed has calculated that right now we are generating over 2 billion gallons of runoff every year. And if you walk in open space frequently the way I do, you've probably noticed along the stream beds if you walk back there when the water's really running, you can see how high it gets and you can see the erosion. So we're altering our water cycle. I thought this was a really interesting slide that shows in, uh, in a natural environment, about half the rain that falls infiltrates into the ground. And in an extreme example of an urban watershed, which has 75 to 100% of impervious cover, more than 55% of the water is now become runoff rather than infiltrating. Only 15% is infiltrating. So I think we have to recognize that we're, unless we uh, adopt some of the newer green infrastructure strategies where we capture and hold the storm water so that it can has more time to infiltrate, we're really changing the way our watershed functions at the same time that the climate is changing and adding these large downpours. So that is compounding and exacerbating the problem in ways that only seem to be getting worse rather than better. So as Jim Waltman likes to say, this is not rocket science. We have more water and we have more impervious cover and that's gonna lead to more flooding. And the issue is really what are we as a community going to do about it? <coughs> This is a really good bird's eye view that shows the type of flooding that we're experiencing. So this is information from FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and it shows what is expected to happen when there's a 100-year flood, and that's in the yellow. Princeton is demarcated there with a the purple line, and um, you can see, obviously, that the, the flooding follows our waterways, but many of our important arteries are located along those waterways. <clears throat> now, a 100-year storm means that there's supposed to be a 1% chance of that kind of storm happening in 100, year, 100 years. But in the last 20 years, Princeton has had three 100-year storms. So those were Hurricane Floyd, Hurricane Irene, and the unusual summer storm that we had in July of 2016. And we recognize that there are problem areas when that happens. So you've seen pictures throughout this presentation, Quaker Road, Mercer Road, River Road, our access to the hospital. Um, and not only is that access important from a getting people to the hospital perspective, but also uh, towns tend to collaborate in situations of emergency. And, and this is a real barrier to that. So we have to think if this is gonna be happening more frequently, these are issues that we really have to deal with. And to go back to this is the town needs to make decisions about where are we locating um, key infrastructures? How do we need to plan for resiliency? All this information is very important to have. George alluded to this, but uh, stormwater has a, stormwater runoff is the largest source of pollution that is compromising our water quality. And this is from a report card that the watershed does from their water testing. And you can see that we are not doing very well. We have elevated levels of phosphorus, and that can come from erosion of stream banks, fertilizers, pet waste getting into our water, and um, elevated levels of E. coli as well. Something that elevated levels of phosphorus does is decrease the level of dissolved oxygen in the water, and that can have very negative impacts on aquatic life. 
So one of the great things I believe about this climate action plan is that we need to figure out what we need to know and we need to pull this information together. I just generated a few questions here, but I'm sure everybody in the audience could come up with lots more of what kind of data do we need to figure out, what kind of connections do we need to identify, how can we bring that all together. And the ultimate goal, of course, is to protect our residents and our property and best adapt to the changes that are coming in our environment and to decide what investments we need to make to protect our community. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christine. Thank you, Sophie and George. And if you don't recognize that photo, that's the lobby in this library. Um, so that was the freak storm in July. Um, and, you know, um, Sophie had listed some of the areas that are prone to flooding. And what we've learned in uh, the resiliency working group that Sophie and George are part of and talking to our um, emergency management folks is what they're seeing is places they can't predict flood now. So it's difficult to prepare um, for these flooding events when you don't know where things are going to start flooding. Um, and so they're seeing some increased um, areas of flooding that they, they just aren't typical. So not to make you all despair, um, we did title this, What is the Climate Action Plan and Why Does Princeton Need One? We hope uh, Sophie and George's presentations have helped you to understand why we think we need one. It's not just about the mitigation strategies about reducing emissions, it's about being a prepared community. Um, but we don't want you to leave with a feeling of despair, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing about it. As Molly mentioned earlier, this is where we are in terms of developing a climate action plan. We have convened a steering committee. As Molly mentioned, it's met a few times. We have started some of our working groups that are devising and, uh, strategies that will help with the mitigation and the resiliency strategies um, for the Climate Action Plan. And we have lots of very um, extremely uh, experts, extreme experts um, for many of these topics. Um, almost all members of the Princeton community, so they're very invested in um, developing a successful plan. Uh, we couldn't be more fortunate to have resources like this in our town and willing and uh, very eager to help with the creation of this plan. So this is just sort of a, a collage of the different types of expertise that we have um, that have, are going to be assisting with creating this plan. Folks from municipal staff, municipal council, folks from our boards, committees, and commissions. Um, we have small independent businesses uh, represented. We have folks from uh, our different neighborhoods. Uh, we're really trying to make a concerted effort that this planning process involves as many stakeholders as possible. We like to say it's not really about the plan, it's about the process. We could have a bunch of smart people sit together in a room and draft a plan that would be a good plan, but it doesn't mean it's going to be a successful plan. And so our goal is to have a drafted plan by the end of 2019, and people say, well, why is it going to take you so long? Again, it's not the plan, it's the process. It's involving folks so that everyone feels invested in the outcome. So here are some potential solutions. Now I want to preface this by saying these are things we are thinking about and want to start communicating with the public to sort of get these ideas out there. These are some, you know, larger scale, more, um, more kinds of efforts that rely on a lot of understanding and community buy-in that other communities are doing. And so we want to just start getting these ideas out there. I want to make it clear these are not, you know, uh, fait accompli's right now, but these are some potential strategies that could help us um, make great strides in reducing our emissions and being prepared. One concept that could help us reduce our emissions from energy is what is called community renewable energy aggregation, also called community choice aggregation. This is, um, uh, to put this in the simplest terms, everyone gets a utility bill. And if you look at your utility bill, there's 
um, two different types of charges you get. You get charged for your usage, the electricity and the natural gas that you consume, but you also get charged for the delivery, the lines and the wires that bring that to your home. You don't have to buy your energy from PSE&G, who is our utility. You have a choice. You can source your energy from a third party. Some people may do that individually. Um, and you can choose to have that source of energy come from renewable sources. Some communities are looking at doing aggregation where the entire community will um, go out to the market and try to procure energy for the community and ask for that a portion as much as possible come from renewable energy. And so there are some communities that are in the process of trying to do this. This is something that Princeton could consider doing. These are opt-out programs. Um, and what they, the, the sort of specifications are a certain percentage of renewable energy that's greater than what you get from your basic generation service from PSE&G. And you would ask for it to be at a cost equal to or less than what you would get. So this is something that communities, as I said, are, are looking to do. And so this is a possibility that we could explore as a community. And you can imagine that by doing this as a larger community, you can sort of, you can get better pricing as a group rather than individually. Something to consider. Another solution for energy is something called community solar. This is, um, right now, it's, it's I'll say it's illegal in New Jersey. The, the regulatory structure is not uh, set up to allow for this to happen, but it is happening in other states. And this is a solution for folks who rent, who can't put solar on their, uh, on their roof, people whose homes may not be uh, ideal for solar because they have too many trees, they have an older roof, or maybe they just don't, um, can't afford it. So community solar is a concept whereby individuals can get together and basically, you know, own a portion of a solar array and you get the benefit and the offset of that energy electricity produced from that solar array that sort of offsets your consumption. So this is something else that could be considered and promoted in Princeton. Um, hopefully the legislation will change and this will be allowable in Princeton. <coughs> Potential solutions that have a large <coughs> impact on transportation. Again, these are large scale sorts of, um, of solutions. Transit oriented development. We know that Princeton is going to have to build a lot more affordable housing in Princeton. And you saw what the impervious surface coverage is already and what it's increased. Well, it's likely there's going to be more. So how we develop that um, is important and one way we can do it in a very smart way is density, building more densely, um, building things so that people are closer to transportation, that it's easier to walk and to bike, to shift away from um, impervious surface that's dedicated to parking, um, and moving you know, to a more compact, connected type of community. Another potential solution that would help us reduce our emissions from waste um, is going to a system called save as you throw or pay as you throw. There are communities that do this. Um, right now you do pay for your waste removal. It is wrapped up in your taxes. Um, and it, you're not really disincented from throwing out more things. You don't directly feel the increased cost that the municipality feels when you throw more things away by putting them out on the curb. So we could shift to a system whereby um, you incentivize people diverting from their landfill bin and putting more of things that can be recycled in their recycling bin and putting food and organic waste into an organic spin and you can have variables to sort of do that incentivization where more frequent pickup for the recycling and the organics and there's no additional cost for that but you may get one landfill bin for free and if you want more you have to pay for it out of pocket so this is something we could shift to as a community which would help set up the incentivization to reduce landfill waste and divert what was going to the landfill to being recycled 
or being composted or otherwise turned into something that's a better product. Another potential solution that would help our town be more resilient is a concept called a microgrid. So this is where you have a set of buildings, usually critical buildings like police departments, fire uh, departments, schools, any sort of emergency response um, buildings um, where they are powered by renewable energy, they have battery backup storage, and they're able to disconnect from the grid when we have a major power outage so that they are up and running when we have storms. And um, you know, this is something Princeton could do. Imagine 400 Witherspoon, that complex down there. We've got the police department, we've got the municipal hall, we've got the fire station, we've got Valley Road, um, bless you. We have um, Community Park School, and I think we have to put the pizza parlor in there too because we're gonna need to eat when the power's out. But um, that could be, you know, um, able to have power when we have uh, power outages. Uh, there are towns in New Jersey that are doing feasibility studies to look at you know, what it would take, um, and this is something we could do here in Princeton to build microgrid. Another resiliency strategy that we could do as a community, which Sophie alluded to a little bit, is green infrastructure. Um, hopefully she has convinced you and George has convinced you that we are going to have lots of water um, that is a resource and we think of it as something now that just needs to be taken away from the property and out of sight. But water is a resource and we should try to keep it uh, where it falls and utilized as best we can. And so green infrastructure um, includes uh, different interventions such as green roofs. Um, the picture up there in the top right hand corner is, you know, imagine along Nassau Street where you just now have these impervious surface between the curb and the street. Imagine that those are vegetative uh, bioswales where they can absorb water rather than just go right into flooding the streets and our homes. So these are a number of strategies. Um, you can do some of these at home with a rain barrel or rain gardens, but you can do larger scale things like green roofs, and these other types of interventions. So, as we mentioned, we've been trying to engage the community in part of this, and um, we have been very conscious of trying to make sure we're hearing from the community about what their concerns are um, with respect to climate change and how it's going to impact them. So we've had, um, you know, at our uh, previous Great Ideas events, we've asked people to fill out the sheets you see in the back about topics that you think are of interest. Um, we've held a f one of our first of three Let's Talk Climate events where we had facilitated uh, discussion groups where we heard people's individual concerns. And we're collecting all of this and we're sharing this with our steering committee and our working groups so that there's a feedback loop, so that they're, as they're making decisions, they're doing so with the understanding of what the community feels is important. Um, and we're gonna continue to be doing this throughout the climate action development process. So how can you get involved? Um, this is an image of the infographic we have in the back, which shows our greenhouse gas emissions and some things you can do as an individual right now. Um, so before you leave, please take a moment to read the sign. And there are just some very simple strategies on here that we can all do um, right now. Switch to LEDs, walk or bike more. Um, so don't despair. Go home and start doing these things. What else can you do? You can come to, if you haven't already been to one of our Let's Talk Climate events, we have two more coming up. One's on um, May 22nd at the John Witherspoon Middle School, and the second is Saturday the 16th at the Princeton Senior Resource Center. And if you are interested, um, please talk to Jenny Ludmer, our Community Outreach Manager. Where is she? She's right back there. Um, and we can help facilitate uh, the same kind of event uh, or a presentation like this with your neighborhood groups, any faith-based groups, youth groups. Um, let us know. We'll host and we'll help you organize an event just like this or the facilitated conversations. 
And of course, sign up for a newsletter, get tips. We send out weekly newsletter with information of what's going on with the Climate Action Plan and what you can do. So thank you very, very much.